I'm fine, I'm fine. And hope you're taking care of your mom and your brother. Uh -huh. Okay, that's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, Auntie Buki, she's not in the office today. They have some family functions over the weekend. She's not back yet. All right, all right. What? Scores? You know what? I'm quite busy in the office right now. When I'm through with what I'm doing, I'll call you back. Okay. So take care of yourself. Be a good girl. Bye. I love you. What's the scores? Scores? My daughter asked me now on phone what's the scores and I was completely lost. Is she a soccer fan? Oh, man. Maybe she was talking about last night's match. Oh, sugar. Y'all are old school, man. What's the scores mean? What's popping? What's up? You know, what's happening? Monsu, if I ask you what the scores, what does it mean to you? Like in it. I think the guy is tradition and I like it. Oh, we haven't seen that song always looks like a house. Huh? I beg. Assess me where well, well. See, I be like cow for your eye. See, see me go to your memory. Oh, go on, memory. Oh, my soul, dear, I love it. Don't ask why they need to see they love it. Don't, see, don't, see, don't, see, don't, see, don't, see, don't. Ah, ah, no, Suru. Ah, you are too stupid as for my lightning. Ah, if you want to sing for yourself, can't you sing better ones like? Ah, no, come and give me this thing. Hey, hey, like Paso. Ah, uh, Isis, how are you? Yes, sir. So, one man is here to see you. He said his name is Steve. He had Oh, oh, he had Is there already? Okay, please bring him in. Bring him in. Monsuru, please excuse us. Mm. You are mad. Yes, you are mad. Punish you all on my behalf. Yes. Oh, uh, I also no want to prove I am one of the entire evil land. Uh, in fact, get away, get away. I want to have a meeting. And uh, yes, get away, get away. I want to have a. Uh, sorry, I was just talking to some bombastic ninkumbu on my phone. Uh, yeah. Okay, please have your seat, sir. You're welcome. Um, Afuda, we spoke on phone yesterday. So, chief, please what? can we do for you? Ah, I want to sue. I want to sue one English called Maxwell. Hey, this is a boy. I single-handedly put him back. Single-handedly? How? I know how many ballot boxes I smashed at the village square, at the church, even at the school. Jesus. Uh, what is Jesus? Don't bite you. Uh, are you not in Nigeria? Can you imagine that? Imagine what? Hey, uh, imagine what? Uh, can you please? Tell these ladies to leave us. I think this is a discussion meant for mature men. No, yes. No, no, no. Calm down, calm down, ladies. Chief, you won't talk to my colleagues in that manner. They are all lawyers, and there's no woman in law. All lawyers are men. So you can continue. Uh, including this one? Especially this one. So, why do you even want them removed from her? Thank you. After winning the election, he has not even visited our, uh, visited our village. Talk less of digging a well or sinking a manhole. You mean no project at all? Uh, none whatsoever. That is why I want you to sue him for me. So that the court can order INEC to remove him in office. How possible is that? It's simply impossible. Chapter 2 of the Constitution. Uh, uh, what are these two which he's talking please, about? Please mind your statement. What they are saying is that according to the law of the land, we cannot punish a political office holder for failure to perform in office. It's just like, um, okay, it's just like the way we can't take super ego players to court for failure to win a match. If that were to be possible, you know Yakubu will be serving a life sentence now and Asenwenga will be... Besides, you have no local standing. Locals? Hey, Maxwell did not give us any chemical to use on our farm. There are plenty locals in our village. <laughs> Local study in law means capacity to sue, and you can't single-handedly sue the man in question. Oh, but 
what I said. Why didn't they give him power? But that's illegal and punishable. See, you can only sue him if you can prove that your personal interest and the cause of action is far and above that suffered by the rest of the public. Oh, that means uh, Maxwell. Uh, Maxwell will not go scot free. Mm, not really. You can initiate a recall process. A uh, recall, Gilly? Chief, you can initiate a recall process. Uh, would that take him out of office? Sure, it will. It will take him out of office. Uh, so how do we go about that one? I am ready to, to give anything that it takes. It's, it's, it's just like a camel passing through the eye of a needle. It's almost <laughs> impossible. Why is this girl almost always against me? If she's not against you, it's just that a um, recall process can be... Mm, how do I... Anita, please bail me out. Explain. Oh. <clears throat> Chapter 69 of the Constitution. A petition will be written to the INEC chairman that the members of that constituency have lost confidence in that member. Is that what I cannot do? The petition must be signed by half of the people registered to vote in that constituency. So, sir, how many villages are in your constituency? Um, um, uh, five. Uh, five. How many of those villages are neglected like yours? Oh, it's our own alone. Sir, how do you intend to get voters from those villages to sign? Oh, oh, those imbeciles. Those imbeciles will never sign anything. And even if they sign by miracle, INEC will now conduct a referendum within 90 days. And you need a simple majority of the voters to vote him out. Please, please, don't let me be ashamed. Please help me Most out. definitely we will. That's why we are here. We will. Okay, so, I mean, it's been a morning of drama hasn't it first it was the stage play and then you had a little snippet of some movie there now somebody's wondering what all that was about we have somebody who featured in that little clip you saw right now he's right here with us in the studio uh his name is coyote adini Yi. he's right here uh, well someone like us if you like uh, uh let me give you a brief profile on this person Graduate of the Premier University of Ibado and the Nigerian Law School, Abuja. Uh, he's a legal practitioner, a broadcaster, an MC, a media premier, <laughs> an author, and a teacher. Uh, he's been on a number of stations, and he's on BCS today. <laughs> morning. A pleasure being here. Thank you so much. Good morning, sir. Good morning, man. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much, my pleasure. So you're sojourn into law. Yeah. Why was that? Ah, law was a childhood ambition. <laughs> and every child has this ambition. I want to be a doctor, I want to be an engineer, I want to be... This. So, yeah. it, for me, it has always been I want to be a lawyer. Okay. And I make sure I pursue this to the logical conclusion. <laughs> and that was... that. I, let me not say that's where it ends. That is uh, how well or how far I went with law. So, that's just all about law. You know, it's um, something I have observed from time to time you have people in the media industry you ask what they studied they probably did not study anything whatsoever mm -hmm. that had to do with the media but in your case i would say it's a bit different because law gives you the ability to speak doesn't it yes actually it does uh, so how did that help you because you're not practicing law now are you actually i practice but not uh, not in, i'm not into litigation Education is a full-time thing. I solicit, I advocate, and I do some See. some behind the scenes things, but not the usual, usual go to court, we gang down thing. No, Why not? I don't do that. Like I said, that is a full-time thing, and it's quite jealous. It it consumes your time and every other thing, which I'm not ready to give at the moment because I'm involved in so many other things. Exactly. I mean that. that I actually, I'm still actually very passionate about. So I don't feel I'm not ready to leave those things for. Precisely. You see, that's that, that's where I was going. When, yes, you have this part of you that always wanted to be a lawyer. Yeah. And you tried to at least achieve that mm -hmm. so as you can hold on to something. But at what point did you realize that you wanted to do more? Unfortunately, or, or let me say, uh, it's quite funny that I lost interest in law before even getting the admission to study law. However, because of pride in courts, I could not back down. Why? Because my secondary school, there was this tradition of art students are dollars. So I was meant, I was planning or I intentionally wanted to change the narrative. Okay. And thankfully I did. So most times 
I grew up in Kwara State. And my secondary school, of our grammar school, is like science students, they go to uni learning. Art students, they go to further poly offer. <laughs> so there is this, uh, there is this mental. So for me, I saw myself as an ambassador of the art class. And for me now to say, I, well, like I said, I lost interest mm. completely in law. And then I feel like if I should tell everyone that, because I've always been screaming, I want to be a lawyer from this one. So if at this moment I'm not saying, I want to do something else. They just feel, guy, guy, I forget. Now because they, you know, get, you know, make cut off for law. That's why they, so because of that, I said, no. If just for that reason, I will study this law. But like I said, right from immediately after secondary school, before getting admission, I lost interest in law. And took up what interests and how did you realize entertainment, you had them? Entertainment. Entertainment generally. Because yeah. immediately I finished from secondary school, I started rapping. I was a rapper. <laughs> I was a rapper for a while. Then from rap to singing, then to comedy. Then you do comedy too? Yes, I was a kind of comedian for 10 years. 2006 wow. to 2016, I retired. I retired from stand-up comedy in 2016. And of course, I, I had a book to that effect. I bow out. That was my first book, I bow out, which is a memoir of my 10 years uh, experience in stand-up comedy. So I ventured into entertainment. Mm -hmm. Then from one thing led to the other. Enter you know, entertainment and media, they are closely related. Okay. That is why even in law at the master's level or some other level, you have media stroke entertainment law. So, Media and entertainment are closely related. So I realized that what I really love is not really the entertainment. It's just the, the media part of entertainment. Let me put it that way. So the moment I noticed that and I realized that, I opted for what I really wanted. You know, I'm imagining media. the likes of um, Basket Mouth, Bovi, and these other guys who have been doing what they do for years. And then mm -hmm. let's, for instance, imagine they just tuned into BCOS right now. They yeah. saw you saying, you had retired from, from standard stand comedy. comedy. Yes. Yeah, just after 10 years. Yes. What, what, yeah, I tell, I, I, I say something and I want to repeat it again that I'm one of the most fulfilled stand up comedians that has ever lived. Why? There must be a reason for that. The reason why I feel strongly that I'm one of the most fulfilled, yes, while I was a stand up comedian, I never bought a car, I never, I never built a house, I never did anything remarkable. The only remarkable thing I did with stand up comedy was getting someone to sponsor my law school. That was the only thing like I said, okay, this is something I picked out. But the, what made uh, my years in stand-up comedy outstanding for me was the fact that I, I ventured into stand-up comedy because I realized that, like I said, entertainment led to media. I wanted to get on radio, to be on radio. And then I made inquiries and they told me, the person I met told me, you cannot come on radio if you don't study anything in communication. Only because that time magazine program was quite popular on radio and they are featuring guest comedians. I said, only if you're a comedian, we can get to feature you. I said, I can't do comedy. Say, hey, then you should try and see and let us do it. And I went back to school. I was in third level then. And I picked up stand-up comedy. So stand-up comedy was, uh, was a means to an end for me. A means to get on radio. I so like I started stand-up comedy in 2006. Right. I got on radio 2008. And ever since then, 2008 till now, I've always been on radio. So... Like I said, I went into it because I wanted something, and I got that thing, and then I mm. left. So for me, I was a very fulfilled stand-up comedian, because like I said, I so served, I achieved, served, served this purpose. purpose, and even gave me extra, which is the sponsorship of my law school. <laughs> so, okay. it's up for me. That's okay. what's, what's the life of a media preneur yeah. like? Mm. Media generally is a life of, um, is a life of attention. Attention is attention is attention is like crude oil in media, and the same thing. And of course, apart from attention being the crude oil, media has a different face. It has different faces. One of which is what I call the incubation period. That incubation period can be challenging, and can be disturbing, can be frustrating. That is when you give your all and you get nothing in return. The same way it applies to media profession, it applies to me being the media printer. When you are giving your everything for little or no results. And that can be tiring, frustrating, sometimes depressing. But then, if you are so confident that you're on the right path, and you know how it works, you will know that keeping at it is the best thing you can do for yourself. Because if you turn back, or you stop at that moment, all the years of sacrifice and everything will just be a waste. So being a media preneur, it's been, a year, it's been years of sacrifice, putting your all and believing that one day very soon it will peak 
let me put it that way. It will peak <laughs> and you will come to people will come to realize what you're doing and then they they believe you. Like I said, it's just the same way with media, media as a profession and media world generally. If you come up now as a new media outfit, people will watch you, observe you, you have to continue to impress them for them now to now believe in you that we can trust you with our money. They now start patronizing you. That is when you start breaking even not even breaking through until one day you capture or you car you you get the attention of someone that is big enough to the right person and say, eh, hey, now right i'm people. getting paid i'm I, I, i've broken through but like i said for now we still a struggle <laughs> you know <laughs> okay oh, thank god you know um something many or maybe i should speak for myself something i've wondered from time to time is um for instance you do all these things and you're talking about the profitability of what you do. Yeah. When you're in Ibadan, and for instance, you get an MC job, and you charge a certain sum, you might get a few frowns and groans before that money is paid. But then you're in a place like Lagos, yeah. and you hike up your charge, and there are no groans whatsoever. You just get an alert. And so for people like you, what does it? Is it the location or the client? Mm, for me, I don't uh, believe the location thing. Yes, I know location could be a very big uh, advantage or disadvantage at a certain point, and of course it has been. But then, coming to put everything in perspective, I just realized that it's just about the figures. The clients are there. Yes, you have some people that believe in you and they want to go for you, but then are they able to pay what you are do they have the capacity to pay what you really feel is the value you are offering compared to your contemporaries outside? Down, there is, is an industry you have to compare. You cannot just say, man, this is how much I charge. Certain points, you meet some colleagues and then you'll be talking, then carelessly or loosely, maybe for whatever reason, they just say, ah, I got a job, that guy paid me uh, 500k. And they just be like, eh? Or you look for this thing, what would they do? But this guy himself, no really try to reach me, you know that kind of thing. You have to compare, naturally. Then you sometimes when you get home you cannot sleep that night because you know you are looking at your biggest client and you, can, you are trying to picture yourself telling the person i'm charging you 500k and then they look at you they look at you scornfully and they start laughing say, yeah, <laughs> you, you must be joking if i tell you i won't pay you 500k you go collect her so you, yourself, you, come, you, you feel they make you feel bad that am i overcharging am i am i am i doing the right thing at the right time but then like i said how do you deal with that Okay, well, before we talk about that, so let's quickly take a commercial break. We'll be back. Oh, <laughs> number <laughs> Mid morning show. Keep watching the back. If you change the channel. All right, thank you so much for staying with us. It's still the mid morning show. I guess second guest is here. Kayode Adeni Afuda Samuel. Thank you so much for still being here. Now before we took that break, we're talking about um, charging as an agency. Yeah. Yes, like I said, at the end of the day, I've come to I've come to a place where I've settled it at the back of my mind is that nobody would determine my price for me. Even right in the city, some people, some of your colleagues, the contemporaries, will still see you and tell you, guy, you are undercharging. You have to. But then I've been out for a while, and I've been doing this, and then I've come to realize that I'm working so I can pay my bills and so I can invest, so I can have a, I can secure my future. If I feel personally that what I'm charging will do that for me, I think I should be okay. I'm not, I'm not going to get disturbed or, let me say, get depressed 
by someone else telling me I charge 1.5. Because at the end of the day, when I, when, when, like I said, we except we want to deceive ourselves, we are human beings. Every day we compare. You want to come, want to assess yourself, assess your growth. You compare yourself with your contemporaries, people who started together and scared. So when I look around, I say, what do they have that I don't have? So I realized that actually it is not in the figure. It is exactly in what is coming in and what I'm doing with it. So like I said, I've got it to a place personally where I'm, where I'm, if I'm charging you, so I have some discussions sometimes with my wife and I'm like, ah, how can you go this low for this person? And you are insisting on this particular one for this particular person. So because that is what, at the moment, that is how I feel. And that is what I feel so works. I, is that that's what works for me. If I'm talking to someone and, and I can see that this person cannot pay what, and I really want to do it for the person, or the person said she really wants to have me or he really wants to have me on the show, definitely I will, I will go all the way to just make sure that we, we agree on something that works. But if I know that you don't really care about if it's me or not me, and you have the money, that I, I insist on certain things. So like I said, I get, I don't bother myself, I don't get disturbed, I don't compare my, I don't let my, I don't let it get to me. If this works for me and I'm happy with it, I'm fine. I don't care what anybody says, I don't care what anybody thinks. So far it works for me and it makes me happy. I'm good. It says in your profile that you are a teacher. Yes, I do. I teach. Who and what do you teach? I teach media. I run a media academy. Oh, okay. I run a media academy where I, I was, um, like I said, it was a moments of trial and error for me, asking questions. Sir, how do I do this? Ah, you have to do this. You have to do it. And then sometimes with people will tell you, sometimes it will flip, sometimes it will flop. But you just have to keep trying. Then I can remember on certain occasions I tried to talk to certain broadcasters back then. I want to understand it. I want to watch how these things are done. But then never had the chance because from then I was in school and some feel you don't really understand. You are too young to, to learn these things. So when after becoming, uh, after being in the industry for a while, I started having people coming to me for the same thing. Say, bros, Alpha, please, so I love what you are doing. Some will say, I want to be like you. I want, can you just teach me? I want to start, exactly, I want to start following you. I want to start following, I want to start observing. Then, but for personally, I believe observation is not as effective as first of all, teaching you those things that you need to know. Then afterwards, you can observe. It's like a driver. I love to use the notion of a driver. You can sit with a driver and watch a driver drive, like many of us have been watching a driver drive for 30 years, and don't know what they are pressing. You know that they press this thing, but you don't know why they are pressing it. But you know that they are driving, but you cannot drive. But the day they are able to take you to a uh, narrow road or a, or a field and tell you this is the accelerator, this is the brake, you put this in, and they explain certain things to you, and they now ask you to watch. By it the time you are watching sense. that, it makes more sense and then you can quickly put one or two together. So that is the reason why I ventured into a media academy where we teach uh, people that are interested in becoming a media, practice, media practitioners. We teach them, this is what you do. These are the rules. We thank God we have the rules. We have the, uh, we have other practices. We just acquaint them with the rules and get them to know these are the things that work. This is how you do this. This is how you don't do it. Okay, well, um, without mentioning any names uh, necessarily, um, we know you also do, like you said, do lots of radio outings. Yeah. And it's something you've been on for a number of years. Yeah. In Ibadan today, we have, should we use the word proliferation? Yes. Of radio outfits, uh, almost 30, if, yeah. if I'm correct, or maybe more. Mm -hmm. What would you say has made Ibadan such a hub for media activity? Uh, I feel strongly Ibadan has the population to support that in the first place. Ibadan has the population to support that. But one of the reasons, which is just the reality based on my own personal observation, I stand corrected, is um, the profitability. Okay. The first, the pioneers of uh, private, whatever in Ibadan, they came in and they were making so much. They were making so much. And then people from outside, investors, businessmen, they were observing. But then probably they, there was no memo to circulate around them that guy had to go here. So all of them just rushed in at the same time. People, people are still coming. <laughs> As I'm talking to you now, many stations, before the end of this year, we still have like two, three more. Because they believe this is a lucrative industry, which of course it is. But then 
they are coming in. Everybody's coming to have a, a bite of the. Would you say there's enough space for everybody? There is. There is. But unfortunately, but unfortunately, uh, from my own observation, everything I'm saying is based on my own observation. Uh, Everybody is just like this whole place now, but because there's this uh, picture I've seen, this image illustration, someone has uh, dug that particular place and found diamond, and this is just the whole terrain. But everybody is coming to focus on that place. There are several other places that are yet to be explored, and that is why that place is like the place is crowded, the place is choking. But there are several other things in this Ibadan that every day, you know, there's this Yoruba saying, Olo, Olo, Olo. And that is one of the that's one of the edict of a, of an average. I wrote something on my status like uh, not long ago. I said limitless dreams, limited resources, makes a man depressed. <laughs> when you see when we wake up and you see opportunities, and then so another new station is announced and you feel like ah, I hope this station will get get. And then you just realize that that same spot is where everybody is going. And then so there there is a particular segment is choked right now, and it's make it make it seem as if Ibad is oversaturated. But trust me, there are several other things that some stations can still do to, how do I call it now, to, to do something meaningful for themselves right here in the city of Ibadan. Like I said, Ibadan has the population. Lagos, of course, Lagos is the home of uh, everything. But then if you compare the ratio of radio stations in Lagos, that of Ibadan. And Ibadan people listen to radio. Lagos, yes, they listen to radio because of their traffic, uh, traffic situation. But in Ibadan here, yeah, an average uh market woman listens to radio True. they listen to, we listen to radio in ibado and that is why if you are mentioning celebrities in ibado apart from some hollywood actors that are based in ibado the next and some musicians like that the next line of celebrities in ibado are broadcast at the oaps do you have your favorites talking over uh, oaps People on the same, on the platform. same platform uh i'm a man of many parts I have favorites from for different things and different 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 things like that so it's very difficult for me to say this one person is my favorite in everything no it's quite difficult what um, your book radioactive what's it about yes radioactive is is more let me say is a compilation of the frequently asked questions that i've come across as a as a media teacher because sometimes people come to you and tell sir i want to go into this but I don't. I I, uh, I studied a Greek. How do you do? You think I can do it? Yes, you can do it. I studied law. I'm a lawyer. I don't have anything at all to do with. Um, I don't have anything at all to do with. Uh, what's it called now? With communication. I did not study anything that has to do with communication, and I'm still doing it. So I encourage them with that. And then another person is coming to me and is telling me, hey, after that, uh, I want to come to your academy, but we are scared. Will your certificate be recognized? And then I have to explain to them again. See. Media is an industry that thrives on your ability, not on your certificates. That is why most times you hardly see uh, submit your CV. Most times, if there is a media opening, they say send a one minute recording. So, if they need the newscaster and you have masters in uh, mass communication and someone has O level and they said send in a minute recording, and the person that has O level can read the news, give them the perfect things that they want. While you have your master's in mass communication and you are reading and you are mispronouncing words, they will consider the person ahead of you. While a certificate is just for you to say, yes, I have been trained, but nobody will employ you based on your certificate. They employ you based on what you can do. So all these questions and answers are what I compiled using my own personal story and the story of several other practitioners. You know, if I come across to say, okay, this is it, people will still ask questions. But when I tell them, you know, I, guess, I, guess, I mentioned some big names. Do you know these people? They didn't study anything that has to do with mass comedy. I think that at that time, they will calm down. And when they talk about uh, certificate and everything, how do I get in? How do I, how do I start my radio career? I give them examples. I give them an example of a particular person, a colleague in the pardon, who was a night guard of the radio station. I was always spending time with the people on the night shift. And when there was an opportunity, when the person on the night shift moved, there was nobody to take the night. I can't do it. You, Chibi, you be, I've always been spending, okay, enter studio, audition. He auditioned, and he did it well. And today, he is an OAP during the night shift. I know of someone else who was a uh, dispatch rider. But as you observe, so many, so like, I, I, 
I compiled all the stories and I tell people, forget about it. You can be a couple, okay, I call you are a service call member and you want to get on radio. Get in. These are, there, is, there, is, there is a strategy, there is a way you do these things for you to get on it. And that's what is compiled in radio active, how to activate a radio career. In What's that thing that we showed a few seconds ago? What were you doing there? You okay, that was at the launching of the book. Talking to someone. That was at the launching of the book of Radioactive on the 30th of May this year. And that was a colleague, uh, Awati Padron. We are having a discussion based on the content of the book because he, we had a reviewer, uh, Dr. Mr. Sander. So he came just to engage me on uh, the content of the book. Okay. The, the gray areas and the area that may seem controversial for me to clarify and shed more light on it. Um, on the proliferation of um, radio stations, you hear some things and you're like, okay, is this really coming from mm. an OAP? It brings in the question of professionalism. How would you rate professionalism with the um, proliferation of um, stations? Uh, of course, everything that has a upside, we have a downside. And when proliferation comes in like that, and people that are investing in it, they are not willing to to invest more in terms of welfare of the people that are concerned. The people, the right quality that they should have, human capacity, human capacity, they will lack it. For example, there is a there is a level. Of, uh, there is a level of pay you expect for someone that is just coming in. I know of a station where uh, once you come in and you start, uh, they start, you start, they start paying you peanuts. Let me put it that way. They start paying you whatever they pay you. You are on it. And if there is an opening anywhere, they keep pushing you. They don't believe in getting someone else from outside because they believe if I want to get someone who has the experience. Someone who has been around, I cannot give him that. So now, they bring everybody in. They use anybody that they can lay their hands upon, just because they don't want to pay. So that is why sometimes, the people that are coming on here, they have honest intentions. They want to make ends meet. They want to live their passion. But they don't have the requisite experience. They don't have the training. And they don't have the capacity. But like I said, there should be a gatekeeper. There's every industry that is sane, Every industry that is, uh, I call it, professional, they have gatekeepers, quality control. And those, if you want to have control quality, you must be able to, you, you are willing to pay for the quality. But if you don't, if you are not willing to pay for the quality, definitely you have to close your eyes and allow certain things to pass. And but then NBC seems to be the gatekeeper in this our industry. Yes, are NBC they not doing seems, enough? NBC. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, what, what are you about? <laughs> our guys, yes, I must laugh because uh, they are our guys. NBC, uh, they seem to be doing their best. They seem to be doing their best. But, but their best is obviously not enough. Their best is obviously not enough. It's their duty to, it's their duty to, how do I call it now, to, like I said, to keep the gate and to ensure that only quality, whatever goes on here. But then sometimes they are overwhelmed. Seemingly, I've never worked there. But sometimes when you hear some things pass, and that is why sometimes they come on air to announce that please members of the public assist us. When you notice something that's not supposed to be, contact us. Because NBC is not, cannot just possibly, no, if we are monitoring five stations, if I'm to monitor, if we are NBC and we are to monitor five stations, it's quite easy. But we have 30 stations to monitor. And, many, and then many sectors within the country are overwhelmed. Yes. Nigeria as a country is overwhelmed. And we don't even want to go start with Nigeria over Nigeria now. But like I said, NBC is overwhelmed. The number keeps increasing, and I doubt if the number of people monitoring at NBC is also increasing. Okay, so what would you like to see, I mean, um, in terms of professionalism? In terms of professionalism, I think um, individuals, individuals should be hungry uh, for, for more. And when you are hungry for more, you just have to keep working on yourself and get better. And of course, employers should also try to invest more, not just in welfare, in training and retraining. We've had a series of trainees at the academy. Of course, we are just facilitating the trainings. We bring in people that has the experience, that has the knowledge. But generally speaking, you advertise to broadcasters, come for, there was a particular training we had on social media. 
social media is one of the strongest tools that you can use and it's one of the things that people are contemporaries or counterparts outside the are using very well and we felt that there is this lacuna we run a media blog as well and what the blog is meant to do is to report the reporters we want to make a celebrity out of our broadcasters so we go we go and snoop on their social media pages to see what can we say about this person but for a week two weeks three weeks a month a broadcaster has not posted anything on his or her social media handle and then we felt that we need to address this. And then we brought in experts to come and facilitate a training on how, as broadcasters, how to use social media to, how do I call it now, to amplify your trade. Profile. Nobody came. We employ, we, we, are, we even gave, we gave each station a free slot that, okay, someone will come for free, then you can, you can pay for others. No, no, because I don't know, maybe they have this feeling that, what do they want to teach me that I don't know? So I cannot totally put the blame on the feet, on the table of the employers or the industry. Even individuals, we must strive to be better. There are several OAPs in Lagos, in other places that I will mention their name, and I've never listened to their program once. How do I get to know about them on social media? And they are getting the endorsements, they are living the life. And while we are here, because, and then when they say, okay, let's come and learn this thing, maybe because it's Afuda, and it's not me. Like I said, that's why if you see any training at Primus, I'm hardly part of the facilitators. I bring in people who I know has the experience and they have to come and we just facilitate. We just bring in, we bring in the experts to come and be the one to do it. But people still will not show. So like I said, it's not totally the blame of the uh, industry. Neither is it for the employer. Individuals should try to do their part. The employer should try to do their part. There are some trainings that are beyond what the individual practitioner can, uh, can carry. The organization should support. And of course, the regulator should also organize trainings not just for the HODs, because sometimes they have a uh, round table with the HODs, but that it should go more than that, it should go beyond that. And then the nation and the federal government, there are so many fundamental things, sincerely. sincerely. But we keep working. We keep uh, working. No, we keep keep hoping and keep believing. And then the individual will strive to yes, get on. better. Okay, thank you very much for coming on the program. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been quite nice thank having you. All right, we'll take another break now and come back with the concluding part and that's Showbiz Report. Stay with us, it's still the mid-morning show.